What's up guys, it's Big Willy, and I just spent the last few days data mining all of Schedule 1's code. I ended up finding a bunch of exploits along the way that I legitimately haven't heard anyone talk about before, so I needed to make sure I shared them with you all. Like being able to double your money every single week, or getting 3000 XP in one day without selling any drugs. What are the actual odds for the casino? And maybe, just maybe, I found some secret things Tyler has been working on that aren't even on the roadmap. You're going to want to stick around until the end for this one because there are some things I found that I don't think anybody else knows about. Now let's get into it. A wise man once said, buy gold and sit on it. That is the key to success. Except, not like this. Did you know that one of the best investments you can do in the mid to late game is buying gold with your surplus money? Well, I sure as hell didn't. I thought it was literally just a decoration until I stumbled upon the code that determines how much money the pawn shop offers you for a product. Now, originally, I thought he offered a random amount every day, but it turns out it's actually pre-calculated. Without getting too far into the weeds, basically what the code does is take the first letter of the item you're selling plus the current day of the week and adds it to a graph between 44 and 180% of the actual value. This means that each item's first letter in the current day correlates to how much money you'll get offered by the pawn shop. So if you try to sell a gold bar at the pawn shop, depending on the day, you'll get either 4,500 or 18,000. And since gold is one of the most expensive non-product items in the game, this makes it super easy to stock up on it and sell it when the timing is right. And what time is best, you ask? Thursday. Thursday is the best time to sell the gold that you stocked up on during the week. So what I do is every single day, once my businesses have finished laundering my money, I immediately run to Herbert's shop and I buy all the gold bars I can. I do this every day until Thursday, and then I dump it like it's a stock market during COVID. I end up making around $500,000 every single week just doing this. Now keep in mind, this does get paid out in cash, so you can't just go spend it at a store. But here's the beautiful thing about it. You can just launder that very cash you just got and redo the entire process each and every week. Just keep enough cash in your bank to keep your operations flowing. With this method, you are quite literally making passive income with compounding interest. It's like Wall Street, except we're making the drugs instead of taking them. Now this one is actually the reason why I started data mining this game in the first place. You see, I kept getting my counter offers rejected and I couldn't figure out why. But after doing some digging, I finally figured out how it actually works. Every customer has a certain enjoyment of different products in the game. For example, Genghis hates ice, but he loves that Colombian snow. And Jesse is a massive tweaker, but isn't a big fan of the ganja. And if a customer really enjoys your product, you can offer a ridiculous amount of money and they're very likely to accept. Tell them to bring me my money. Yeah! However, if they do not like the product you have for sale, you can actually counter offer them a different product that they enjoy more in order to still get a lot of money out of them. You can go to the website schedule1wiki.org and under the customers tab, you can see every single customer's preferred product and their budget. It's a super useful resource that I use all the time, and I'll leave a link to it down in the description below. Schedule 1 is discriminating against certain NPCs. <gasps> well, <laughs> not really, but some NPCs do have a shorter cooldown for when they're able to buy drugs again, and it's entirely based on their name. Yeah, for some reason the cooldown period is based on their name's first letter which means that NPCs whose names start with F, P, and Z will have a way shorter period before they can buy again compared to other names. Shout out my boy Peterphile. I swear he is the most consistent customer I got. Now this one is probably the most useful tip out of all of these. I managed to find a way to get 3000 XP in a single day. When I was scouring the code, I stumbled upon the add XP function. And so I decided to take a look at what possible sources there are for getting XP. Now, you all probably know that you get 20 XP for each sale you do, and 10 XP if a dealer does it instead. But did you know that you can get XP from escaping the cops? It turns out that when escaping from the cops while in Wanted, Dead, or Alive, it gives you 60 XP. Now, you shouldn't try this in real life, but I found out that aiming a gun at a police officer will immediately escalate your current crime level to wanted dead or alive. 
and each time you escape the cops, you'll get 60 XP for it. Which means that if you trap the police officers at the police station with a Veeper, run out and wave a gun in their face, and then hide for 30 seconds, you'll get 60 XP. And if you do this for the entire day, you end up with 3000 XP, which is literally more experience than you would get selling drugs. This is easily the best way to level up in the mid to late game. And while you wait for the wanted level to clear, maybe you should go hit the casino down the street because... Contrary to real life, gambling is actually extremely profitable in Schedule 1. The slot machine is an absolute money printer. The reason the slots are so profitable is because the odds are unweighted. This means that you have a completely neutral 1 in 6 chance to get any symbol. You're just as likely to get a lemon as you are the 7. Now, I'm not going to bore you with all the math and probability calculations, so you're just going to have to trust me here, but the slots have an EV of 135%. And for those of you who aren't fucking nerds, this means that if you put in $1,000, you are expected to make $1,350 on average. It's a slot machine with no house edge whatsoever. But if card games are more your style, I also learned something new about Blackjack and Ride the Bus. The entire time you're playing these games, the game is running through an imaginary deck of cards in the background and keeping track of which cards have been played. As someone who works in technology, Tyler did not have to do this. It would have been 10 times easier not to track the discarded cards and just randomly generate the next one, and I bet no one would have ever noticed. But he really went out of his way to add that extra polish. You can really tell how much he seriously cares about this game, and it gives me a lot of hope for the future. And honestly, the fact that the card games are fair surprised me a lot, because I cannot count the amount of times that I have been playing blackjack, and the dealer magically happens to draw the exact card they need to win. I was like, this shit has got to be rigged, right? But in reality, it's a skill issue, and I'm just garbage. It's not rigged at all. Skill issue. As I was data mining this game, I also found multiple unfinished features that I'm guessing Tyler is going to add in the future, or maybe he just decided to discontinue them. But I figured you all would want to know about these. The game has code for a utilities app, which shows the water and power usage of your properties. It also has unused fields for dumpster counts and emptying costs, which would mean that every time you or your employees run the tap water, it would cost you 10 cents per liter, and the price per kilowatt is set at 25 cents. Also, there's a model for a small power tower that you'd hook up to your machines. These power towers are a bit special because they would be constructible outside of the property instead of inside. So maybe you were supposed to hook it up to the utility poles first and then to your equipment? I honestly don't know. I haven't seen anybody else even mention this before. I was also able to find an alternative dealer management screen that seemingly has controls for rest, contracts, assigned vehicles, and products. This could have been an old alternative version of what we have now, but all code referencing this menu has been cut, so I think it's just an old version, but it's still really interesting to see how dealers were supposed to have cars they could sell out of. I'm in my mum's car. Broom, broom. In the code, there is a model for a character titled Loan Shark. He wears jeans and a flannel t-shirt, and he drives around in a shitbox with bullet holes. I think maybe this is a mechanic coming out regarding your suppliers. Maybe they put out a hit on you if you don't ever pay them back. You know our girl Miss Shirley Watts does not play around. But it could be something else entirely. So bear with me and put on your tinfoil hats for a minute here. Do you remember the two shady people Uncle Nelson sends you to meet in the prologue? Well, they kind of look like the Lone Shark model in the code. Sure, their shitbox doesn't have bullet holes, but one of them is wearing the flannel from the model underneath his vest. And if you look carefully, Hidden in the trees right next to the barn, there are two dirt piles. In the game's code, these dirt piles are named Lone Shark Graves. Coincidence? I think not. I'm starting to think they're the ones that tipped off the feds, and old Uncle Nelson had some shooters take care of them. And I figured I would throw in some more random facts I found that weren't really interesting enough to warrant their own section. The slot machine has a check for if the game is running from the Unity editor, which means that if you can somehow trick the game into thinking it's running from inside the editor, you can get jackpots on every single spin. You can actually force all dead drops to go to just one box, since the game rules out dead drop boxes that have any items in them. 
If you put an item in all of the boxes except for one, they should only go to that last empty box. And the game has a is white function, which checks if the sum of your skin color's RGB is larger than one and a half. And that's all the secret stuff I was able to find, but if y'all are curious about anything else, leave a comment down below and I'll do my best to investigate it. This video took around 50 hours to make. Between all of the editing and the massive amount of research I had to do, it was definitely a task. But I feel like it was worth it. So if you'd like to see more content like this, go ahead and click that subscribe button. It genuinely helps a lot more than you realize. Peace.